about this most precious message, how it came to us. Grant us an understanding of the history, to know what has happened, therefore to know how we can receive the gift of repentance that heaven wants to give us. So guide us in our thoughts. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> all right, the story of 1888, I think you already know. First of all, come in, you are welcome. We go back to the 1844 movement. William Miller began to preach the first angel's message in 1831. The Lord blessed and eventually upwards of 50,000 people in North America embraced the message, plus some in Europe, some in England and so forth. Then came the great disappointment. The great mass of the people forsook the message. A little handful held on because they recognized the true spirit of God was in the midnight cry. Amen. It wasn't only their arithmetic that held them. It was the Holy Spirit, that conviction. Well, that little group of people were the ones who followed Christ by faith into the most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. That was the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist church, but they were all Sunday keepers. They hadn't heard the Sabbath yet, but they had heard the beginning of the sanctuary message. Because you know the story of Hiram Medicine walking through the cornfield the morning of October 23, 1844. Idea came to him, maybe the sanctuary is not this earth. Maybe it's not the second coming of Christ we're waiting for. Maybe the sanctuary is open, that most holy apartment. And they got the studying and they found the truth. So it's important, come in, you're welcome. It's important for us to know that the Seventh-day Adventist church has not built, been built totally on the Sabbath doctrine. It's built upon the sanctuary doctrine, see? And that's the very thing the devil hates today. And you can go to the average church Sabbath after Sabbath, year after year, and never hear a sermon on the cleansing of the sanctuary. Well, that's the background. Well, 1846, these dear people um, got an idea. Well, we got a board here. Maybe we can write something. I found one of these. Will it work? Yeah, 1844, that was our beginning. Well, actually 1831, back there. And then they accepted the sanctuary doctrine. That's what was the beginning of the thing. That little group were becoming reconciled to God and his truth. And then about 1846, Rachel Preston gave that little group the Sabbath message. And they didn't fight it. They didn't quarrel about it and try to resist it. They opened their hearts to receive that truth, which is the way we ought to receive every truth that God sends us by the humblest agent possible. And then they accepted the beginning of the health reform message give up their tobacco, give up their liquor, and unclean meats, they accepted that. And then they accepted the rudiments of a dress reform well, message. Who, who gave the health message then? The health reform, who gave it? Ellen White, wasn't that the vision? Was it well, it, it was a spontaneous thing, and Ellen White endorsed it. You see, it is true, Ellen White is not the origin of our doctrines. Our doctrines came from the Lord, but she endorsed them. She did not bring us to Sabbath. Actually, she did resist the Sabbath at first. She did. And then she was convinced it's true, then she opened her heart to receive it. But even, even some dress reform was developed there. Boy, they sure needed it. Well, I think we need it today, too, in some respects. <laughs> and then we come up here to 1856. 
and this little group of people still weren't called Seventh-day Adventists. They were called Sabbath-keeping Adventists. You remember the story. Then they met in 1856 in May in a little conference in Battle Creek, Michigan. And while they were there, Ellen White was given a vision from the Lord. It was an angel speaking to her. And you'll find this in volume one of the testimonies, pages 131, 132, somewhere there. And the angel said, of the people present at this conference, some will be food for worms. I'm quoting exactly. Terrible expression to you. Food for worms. There it is in the testimonies. You can read it. It's what the angel said. What he meant was, they're going to die. Some will accept the mark of the beast. And that is bad news. But number three, some will be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated when Jesus comes. 1856. I didn't say that. Ellen White didn't say that. Now, there are people who say, oh, ho, oh, that's a big joke. That proves Ellen White's a false prophet. She didn't say it. The angel said it. And somebody says, well, then you can't trust the angels, can, can you? Was the angel referring and looking towards 1888 as, as a possible closure to things? Is that why this statement was made? Hang on a minute. Okay. Good question. Are the angels omniscient? No. no. Jesus expressly said, even the angels don't know the day or hour of his coming, the time of his second coming. Angels love to study the Bible like we do. That's a fact. Angels have to learn. They are finite beings. But the angel in heaven, and the angel was representing the I'm sure he was representing the view of all the holy angels. They were happy to see that a little group of people hung on after the great disappointment. They were happy to see them accept the truth of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Oh, it wasn't developed. They just got the beginning of it, see? But they opened their hearts. This made the angels happy. They were happy to see them embrace the Sabbath message. They were happy to see them embrace the beginning of the health reform, dress reform. Every light, ray of light that God sent those people, they accepted it, including they accepted the spirit of prophecy. They recognized in Ellen White the fulfillment of God's promise that the remnant church will have the testimony of Jesus. And so they came to 1856 and the angel told the truth. He sincerely believed that these people who have accepted all this light will continue to accept light and be ready for the coming of the Lord. And heaven did not let the angel down. But as time went on, year after year here, as the church began to grow, our pastor evangelists, and I'm not too far from that era of the, of the tent evangelism, that day is almost over. I got my start as a tent master in an evangelistic campaign. And everywhere our evangelists or pastors would go and pitch a tent, they would turn the city upside down. And all the Sunday keeping pastors would preach in their pulpits against Seventh-day Adventists, which caused the people to come, naturally, you see. <laughs> And in most cases, it was, it was almost a, a pattern. When they took the tent down, they built a church and raised up a church. And that way, the Seventh-day Adventist church was growing. And Sunday-keeping pastors would challenge them to debates, just like Dale Ratzliff has challenged the whole denomination to a debate over the Sabbath. It's, it's just, same history being acted over again. And our pastors would practically win every debate. And they got to walking around with their nose in the air. We can win every debate. The truth is wonderful. 
church is growing and everything's just fine. And they were preaching legalism. And Sister White said later that we have preached the law, the law, until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa. In the year 1887, she wrote a number of burning messages that were published in the Review and Herald, telling how legalistic we were, how self-satisfied, how arrogant we were, how we must humble our hearts before the Lord. We need a revival and reformation. And even she did not know what was coming up. In the year 1882, there was a camp meeting held in Healdsburg, California. And a young man, at that time in his 20s, on Sabbath afternoon, he tells what happened. He forgot who was preaching. It was Ellen White, in fact. But he suddenly realized Christ had died for him. And he saw Christ on that cross, crucified for him personally. That was the first time this young Adventist boy came to realize Christ died for him. And he determined from that day on he was going to restudy his Bible with the idea that the entire Bible is a presentation of Christ and him crucified. Well, as time went on, he became the editor of the Signs of the Times, which was our missionary mag magazine at the time, published here on the West Coast. I say here on the West Coast, excuse me, on the West Coast. And about that same time, I forget the year, I think it was the same year, a young private in the U.S. Army up in Walla Walla, Washington, got hold of the Sabbath truth, learned about the Sabbath church, gave his heart to the Lord, was baptized. As he came up out of the water, he raised his hands to heaven, said, Lord, all I have is yours. He was sincerely converted, A.T. Jones. And they got together later in, in uh, Oakland, California. And when the old elder uh, Wagoner became ill and had to go somewhere, these two young, young men took over editing the signs of the times. And they came to the conclusion that the heart of the Adventist message is not the law, the law. It's Christ and him crucified. And they studied Galatians, and they discovered what Galatians means. And that rings a bell with me because I was the only Adventist boy in my high school for four years, and uh, I had a terrible problem over the Sabbath. I used to play the violin fairly well, and they'd ask me to come and play for Friday night programs and parties, and I had to say no. And all the ball games were on, guess what, Friday night. Yeah. And in my senior year, uh, the, uh, the high school faculty asked me to represent our high school in the Florida State Academic Contests for English and English Literature. Well, I was glad to do that. And I studied and studied, you know, to get ready. And then the message came that the, for Central Florida, the exam will be on a Saturday morning. And I told our Baptist principal, I'm sorry, I can't do it. And he said, well, Robert, you'll have to do it. I said, well, I can't. Well, Robert, you ought to read the book of Galatians. That will straighten you out. And so I tried to read the book of Galatians, but it didn't make sense to me. And by the way, because I refused to go and write the exam on Sabbath, he must have made some phone calls or something and got it changed to Wednesday morning so I could write. Amen. And I won first place in the whole of Central Florida. That was Orlando, Kissimmee, St. Cloud, Lakeland, you know, all those towns around there. That meant I had to go to the finals at Florida State University later on. So more study. Here comes the news, the exam for English literature, and English is Saturday morning. 
Again, I said, I can't do it. And Mr. Rutledge was really upset this time. He said, Robert, it's too late. We can't change it now. Where's your school spirit? Ever hear that? <laughs> Why aren't you loyal to your own high school? I said, Christ comes first. I must keep the Sabbath. So some more frenzied phone calls. And they changed it to Friday afternoon so I could write the exam. And I went first place in the state of Florida. Now that was my beginning. But I didn't understand Galatians. Well, these two young editors were studying Galatians. And when I studied Galatians, it looked to me as though Mr. Rutledge was right. That obedience to the law is slavery. It's the curse. The curse of the law is on, it seemed to say, is on all those who obey it. And if you keep the seventh day Sabbath, you're under the curse of the law. And I couldn't understand it. Well, later I discovered the truth. I'll tell you about it later. Anyway, in the year 1888, all of Ellen White's prayers were answered. These two young men were delegates to the general conference session of that year. They had a prayer meeting before they left, and they asked the Lord to guide them. And they were both asked to speak because the signs of the times had upset the brethren in Battle Creek so badly that the brethren in Battle Creek wanted to turn the 1888 session into a debate. They all loved debating, you know. And they were sure that they could squash these two young men. And some of the writers who have written about this history openly say, had it not been that Ellen White defended Jones and Wagoner, the brethren would have disfellowshipped them. That's how serious the objections were. And these two young men presented their belief which actually was a presentation of righteousness by faith in the light of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. Now, Wagoner did say that what he's preaching is in harmony with what Martin Luther preached. That he was simply trying to lead the church back away from this legalism to the gospel that, that uh, Martin Luther preached. But I don't think in context Wagner would have dared to say that what they presented was not further light beyond Martin Luther. Because they understood that the cleansing of the sanctuary is something very important. And they were not only satisfied to work out the arithmetic, you know. They wanted to know what is the real spiritual significance of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, of the two young men, the one who most prominently proclaimed the sanctuary message was A.T. Jones. We don't find that Wagoner was as uh, forward as Jones was in talking about the sanctuary. But he believed it. When he died, in 1916, well, well, anyway, I shouldn't, I should have started over there, shouldn't I? I'll <laughs> oh, forget it. When he died, way down here in 1916, he wrote a letter the night he died of a heart attack. And he said that 25 years ago, he gave up the sanctuary doctrine. Well, that'll take you back a long ways. And I think he was too sick to understand what he was actually writing. Because we have documentary evidence he did preach the sanctuary doctrine. But not as strongly Who was as Jones died did. Who in 1916? E.J. Wagoner. E.J. Wagoner. <coughs> May 28, 1916. Well, I'm sorry to, oh, thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry to tell you that our dear brethren, in Battle Creek, the general conference leadership and the various presidents of the local conferences were not happy to hear Jones and Wagoner. The general conference president in particular was opposed. 
And Ellen White says she had to stand almost alone before the entire General Conference Assembly. Stuck out like a sore thumb. And the brethren resented her. They had the idea that she was creating dissension and contention by supporting young Jones and Wagoner against the gray-haired leadership of the General Conference. Well, she stood there and she pleaded with the brethren, please open your hearts and receive this light. She did not say at that time that it was the beginning of the latter reign. It took her a while to come to that conclusion. But by 1892, by 1890, sorry, by 1890, she had come to that conclusion that what Jones and Wagoner were preaching were showers from heaven of the latter rain, close quote. 1892, actually, 1891 or 92, she began to express some strong hints that the message was the beginning of the loud cry of Revelation 18. That was November 22, 1892, she said that. Then came the 1893 General Conference session. I don't know whether we have the bulletin here. Does anybody know if it's here for sale? The 1895 bulletin is there. I know that. The 1893 Do they also? Well, I would oh, urge. It's the brown. It's the brown. Company. Okay. I would suggest you get it. In fact, I would suggest you, dear people, study. Please don't believe a word I say because I say it. Study for yourselves. 1893 and 1895 are both there. They are sermons by A.T. Jones that he preached at general conference sessions. See, in 1888, nobody thought that what Jones and Wagoner were saying was worth writing down. So nobody took a stenographic report. But in 1891, they began to do that, but they didn't do it thoroughly. But they did get some notes, and some notes were published, and you have several sermons by Wagoner from 1891 that are very helpful. But by 1893, they were thorough and careful. They took down every word by shorthand, and then they transcribed it, published it. Well, time went on. By 1896, we have Ellen White, Ellen White declaring that, to a great degree, the message was kept away from our people and kept away from the world. And so during these years, from 1888 up to 1896, every effort was made by the Lord to bring the message to the attention of our brethren in different ways. In 1891, so strong was the opposition against Ellen White herself that she was exiled to Australia. The common assumption is that she was sent there to be a missionary. And she did do missionary work. Yes, she did. The honest truth is she was exiled. And she writes about it in this book here. Uh, I'm not sure I can turn to the page. Why was there opposition against her? Because she supported the 1888 message, that's why. Exactly, that's why. Anyway, the, the letter is quoted, I hear. I think it's quoted almost in entirety that she wrote to the General Conference President explaining it was not the Lord's will that I go to Australia at that time. You, brethren, wanted me out of the way, and you sent me there contrary to the Lord's will. And the review, the Adventist Review, has admitted that the editor is an Australian. And on the cover, just a few years back, he wrote that Ellen White was exiled to Australia. The truth of our history is not a very pretty thing to look at. 
Over 100 times, Ellen White has said that the reaction of our brethren in this era here was just like who? Jews. Jews. That's right. Just like the Jews. Over a hundred times she said that. Now that does not mean that God has forsaken this church. It doesn't mean you should go out and start some little offshoot somewhere. That does not mean you should go start a home church. I don't believe that. I believe it means you should be aware of the truth, be ready to bear witness to the truth, and join us in praying that God will give us the gift of repentance. The solution to our problem is not a new organization. It's repentance within this organization. Well, Ellen White was in Australia, did a wonderful work there, yes, oh, I tell you, she it was miraculous, really, what she did in Australia. An evidence of what the Lord would have done for the whole world. Then we come to the year 1901. She came back in 1900. There was a general conference session scheduled for 1901, which would meet in Battle Creek. And she attended. And the day before the conference opened, she met the brethren, the General Conference brethren, and I presume what delegates were available, in the library of Battle Creek College. And she spoke to them. And there are two versions of what she said. There was one version that is authentic, taken in shorthand, including all of her grammatical errors, she would say, he don't, instead of he doesn't. Things like that, you see. And uh, I, if I remember right, it reports her as saying, don't you never quote Ellen White until you quote the Bible. And she said it was some verb. But the, the White estate have edited that version, and they have reported it in grammatical language much more smooth than that. But she had a burden that this 1901 session would undo what happened in this session here. That was her heart burden. That all the wrongs, this was the darkest decade of Adventist history. We got into terrific financial problems. The General Conference were in debt, tithes fell off, Oh, they were, they were in terrible difficulties there. And that was during that, during that time, Conradi, not Conradi, Ken Wright apostatized. Terrible thing happened. And Kellogg began to go off on pantheism. It was an awful situation. So the 1901 session came, and angels from heaven walked up and down the aisles of the Battle Creek Tabernacle. The Lord blessed at the very first session, the president uh, said, now let's come to order. And I, he must have made an invitation of some kind. But Ellen White got up, said, I have something to say. And she walked down to the podium and she delivered a message to those people that electrified them. And they scrapped their agenda and they turned their attention to revival and reformation. Amen. And they changed the organization of the church. Some of our brethren have reported in their opposition to this book, 1880 Reexamined, there is strong opposition to it on the part of some. They tell us, well, at one time, the General Conference published a little book that said that the rank and file of Adventist ministers at the 1888 session gladly accepted the message. A handful opposed it. The truth is the rank and file rejected the message and only one or two accepted it. The only ones that we know accepted it were Willie White, well Ellen White, yes. She was on the right side all the way through. Her son Willie 
was favorable, although I'm not certain that Willie ever did fully understand the message. But another pastor did understand it and accept it wholeheartedly, and that was Stephen N. Haskell. And I would urge you, if you ever get a chance to buy any book by S. N. Haskell, do so. He was on the right side. And beyond those names that I've mentioned, we don't know of anybody who openly accepted the message at Minneapolis. In 1903, Ellen White wrote a letter to Judge Jesse Arthur in which she said, quote, the result of the last general conference session, this is 1901, has been the greatest, the most terrible sorrow of my life. No change was made. So those who tell us that the 1901 conference succeeded in undoing the damage of the, of the 1888 conference, and ever since then, the latter rain has been falling. They're mistaken. That did not happen. And finally, in 1915, the dear lady died, still expecting that the revival and reformation was in the future. And here we are today. Any question thus far? Uh, how could they equate scripture to the what happened in 1888 as a lot of rain when uh, when, when the latter rain was supposed to be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Where did that rationale come from? Well, it was Ellen White who said that. It wasn't the brethren. The brethren did not recognize that the latter rain began at the 1888 conference. Ellen White recognized that. That was her words. Those were her words, yes. And here's why. Because the latter rain is not emotionalism. It's not big baptisms. The latter rain is a message of Christ our righteousness. I thought it was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a message that exalts Christ and Him crucified. Amen. And the message does the work. And our people have often misunderstood that, and they, they think of the, of the latter rain, as, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it's going to make you roll on the floor and talk in tongues and shout and scream and work miracles and raise the dead and so forth, work all kinds of miracles. But the latter rain is what prepares the grain for the harvest. And what prepares the grain for the harvest is not miracle working. It's a message that is clear, that presents Christ as Paul preached Christ to the Galatians. He says, Christ was presented before you, crucified among you. The people forgot where they were, they saw Christ crucified. Which is what happened to Wagoner back here in 1882 in that Hillsburg, California camp meeting. He saw Christ crucified by faith. Changed his life. Yes. The, the, the glorious change had taken place, and she she saw the people, the the, num the, the numbers of the company that had lessened and yeah. now clothed with the armor. Yeah. This is early writing. The great about. change had come over them. Yes, the mm. great change had come over them. And, and she asked, "What she caused says, this I asked change?" What had made this yes. Change. An angel answered, "It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel." Notice she she uses those. Terms, all, or the angel uses those terms synonymously. And that's what, um, you know, as I was studying these issues years ago on my own, uh, that's what led me to conclude that when she said the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in a revelation of the message of Christ our righteousness, that's, that, that clearly links 
the events and happenings of Minneapolis and the message that was proclaimed there with the latter rain. Yes. Thank you, Skip. That's very helpful. But indissoluble link between yeah. those two. But please note, that is the book Early Writings that she wrote back in 1850, yes. you see? And it was fulfilled in 1888 as the beginning of the latter rain came. It was a message that melted human hearts. And if the message had been accepted there, if the General Conference had opened their hearts like they, the brethren did back here in 1844-46, and said, we love this message, thank you, Lord, and gone out, the Lord said, Ellen White said, God commanded it should be preached in every church. The, the world would never again have said that Adventists preach the law of the law. We would have had the reputation, that's the church that preached Christ and crucified. And the world would have been enlightened, yes. And the work would have been finished by 1893. Now, from, I'll have to start a new timeline here from 1916 on. I'm going to start over here so I have more room this time. So Ellen White dies in 1915. There comes a great Bible conference held in Tacoma Park in 1919, which is very significant. And as we go on down the line here, from the 1901 conference, when Wagner preached on the nature of Christ very clearly, all through these years, until 1929, there was nothing here that I've ever found in the Adventist Review or the Signs of the Times that clearly articulated the 1888 concepts. I came on the scene in 1929. By the way, some people think that I'm so old I was a delegate to the 1888 <laughs> conference. <laughs> but I was baptized in 1929. I left the Presbyterian church with its beautiful Gothic windows and its pews and its lovely pipe organ and the robed choir and a DD pastor and joined this little dinky Adventist church just about as big as this room here. We sat on benches that didn't even have a piano, just an old wheeze organ. And they sang songs like, to the work, to the work, to the work, let's work. <laughs> But I knew it was the truth. I knew the Sabbath had to be right, and I held on in spite of everything. I'm glad I did. And it wasn't until I was privileged to attend an Adventist college, I wanted to go to Union College and be under Andreasen because I had a godfather. Because in 1927, I'm sorry, I won't take long with this. In 1926, we moved to a little town in Florida where my father wanted to get out of Miami. We were in Miami. And uh, my father was a strict Lutheran by belief, and he kept Sunday very strictly. And he felt that Miami was so full of immorality and wickedness, he didn't want to raise his boys in Miami. So I went to this little town called St. Cloud, and that's where I grew up. Well, it so happens that St. Cloud, at that time, was a Civil War veterans retirement center. And among the Civil War veterans who were living in St. Cloud was brother and sister J.G. Matheson, and their daughter was Mrs. Oliver Montgomery. And Oliver Montgomery was the General Conference Vice President. So as I was boy, growing up as a boy of uh, 10 years old there in St. Cloud, well, I was baptized when I was 12, Elder Montgomery took me under his wing, see? And every Christmas he would bring me a 
a mission storybook for a Christmas present. So I would someday be a missionary, which I'm very thankful for. And when I finished college, finally, I had no money. I had no thought I could ever go to an Adventist college, which required money. I'd gotten two scholarships to universities as a result of winning first place in this state Florida <laughs> contest, you know. And I went to camp meeting alone. My parents didn't go. And on Saturday night, Elder Montgomery got hold of me, not literally, but he got hold of me and said, Robert, you must go to Southern Junior College. And I found a young couple driving their little Ford Coupe all the way up to Collegedale, and I got a ride for you. And you go up there, and I'll meet you up there next week. So I was off. That's how I got to an Adventist college. Wow. So. <laughs> and um, he wanted me to go to Union College later because uh, he believed that Elder Andreasen had the truth that our young ministers ought to learn. Now today, Elder Andreasen is being opposed quite strongly by some of our scholars. But at that time, I wanted to go, but I couldn't because I had no money to go to Union College. But I did have a chance to work carrying trays at the Washington Sanitarium. That's why I ended up there. Well, it so happens that there in Tacoma Park, there was an old man who had been present at the 1888 conference. And my Bible teacher knew about him, and he invited him to speak to all of us boys who were in what we called the ministerial course. And that's where I learned about 1888. And one day in Bible class, our Bible teacher made a statement. He said that Elder John Ford does not understand the two covenants. Well, Elder John Ford was the greatest evangelist we had at the time. He was Doug Batchelor and Mark Finley all rolled into one. He was, he was something. And all of us preacher boys used to dream of someday we could be like Elder John Ford, you know, and baptize lots of people. And that shocked us. And I said, well, uh, who does understand the two covenants? He said, well, I don't know who does. And then I said, well, where could we learn about it? He said, well, the best he'd ever read was in a book called The Glad Tidings by E.J. Wagoner. And I had no idea who Wagoner was. I went to the library, and of course, the book wasn't there. It wasn't even in the Review and Herald Library. Can you believe that? I can believe it. So he brought his own copy and put it on reserve. We couldn't check it out, but we could read it in the library. Like Luther's Bible that was chained to the wall of the library, you know. And I, when I read it, chapters three and four especially, someone came to me here and said, you know, I'm trying to read the glad tidings and it's boring. And I sympathize with him because you read chapter one, two, it is boring. But chapters 3 and 4, that's where it gets to be lively. I copied chapter 3 on my old typewriter. It warmed my heart. I had never understood the gospel presented so clearly before. I saw the gospel as good news. I'd been baptized nine years before and had never heard anything like this. I'm telling you my testimony, that's all. I tell you, I was moved by that book. I still love it to this day. I love to read it again. And I took those pages with me to Africa. Uh, we were called out there in 1945 by the General Conference, 1945, to Uganda. And I soon discovered that we had a problem in Uganda. And the problem was sexual immorality. 
and it was something terrific. We would appoint teachers to go out to our little mission schools that we thought were good converted Adventists. And then the district commissioner, the British district commissioner, had to write me a letter and tell me, uh, Mr. Whelan, I'm sorry to inform you that the teacher in your school so-and-so is having carnal relations with the girls. Even the British administration had no, didn't approve of that. And I had to, to call the teacher in. And this happened time and time and time again. Got to be a plague. And I'd ask the teacher, I've heard this report about you. Oh, no, Buona, I, I could never do a thing like that. that that's impossible. So I got conflict of interest there. So I got to go out to the school, see? And call the church elders together and try to find out what's what. And every time there was not even one exception, never did I find a teacher told the truth. Every time when we finished, the teacher would hang his head and say, Buona, I'm sorry, it's true, the devil made me do it. I got to thinking, what's the use of my preaching the fourth commandment to these people when the problem is the seventh commandment? You may not know it. Uganda has been known as the AIDS capital of the world. I've heard that too. You heard that. The most Christian sub-Saharan nation in Africa is Uganda. And it has the reputation all over Uganda, all over Africa, as the most immoral African nation. The Roman Catholics and the Church of England built two beautiful cathedrals in Kampala on two of Kampala's seven hills, complete with pipe organs. A Christian nation. But here was this plague. These people couldn't handle the problem of sex. And I felt sick at heart. What am I wasting my life here for? I'm going to dry up and blow away here. I wish I could go home. I don't want to spend my life trying to settle these problems like this, settling these arguments. And then I remembered those pages that I had typed from the book, The Glad Tidings. What, Ellen, what El, uh, Wagoner said about the nature of Christ. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He condemned sin in the likeness of our fallen sinful flesh. I got those pages out and I restudied them and the light came on. And Sabbath morning in our largest church at Nawanendi in Busoga, Uganda, I asked the people a question. Do you people believe Jesus was tempted like we are? Oh yes, yes. Was he tempted to uh, steal something? Oh yes. Was he tempted to tell lies, do you think? Well, yes. Was he tempted to sleep with the girls? Oh no, no. Impossible. And I knew I'd found the source of the difficulty. If your Savior was not tempted to break the seventh commandment, you have no Savior from breaking the seventh commandment. That's right. Because only in that wherein he himself has suffered being tempted is he able to succor them that are tempted. Well, I began to preach what I understood to be the 1888 message to the Africans in Uganda. And I, I'll have to testify, the Lord did bless. He brought healing to the church. For the first time, I saw tears in African eyes Amen. as I talked about the cross of Jesus. And then, bang, the General Conference sent word, you and Grace and your children are welcome to go home to America for furlough after only three years in Uganda, if you wish. 
or you can choose to elect to be under the the Africa Division policy, because that was the Northern European Division policy we went out under in 1945. Or you can take a seven-year term and spend six months in South Africa. Well, which would you have chosen? And so we chose to go home to America after three years. Well, something else happened in Uganda. The Church of England had a great revival going on, and it came from Rwanda, of all places, where the genocide was in 1994. That so-called revival was called the Abolokli, or the Saved People Revival. And the idea was, you are sanctified instantly when you profess their doctrine that Christ has come into your heart and he has saved you already experientially, see? Not legally, they didn't have that idea at all. But he has saved you experientially, and therefore from now on you cannot sin. Even if you take the women out in the bushes, that's not a sin anymore, because now you've been saved, see? <laughs> and oh, they would dance a little jig and they would sing to the tenderes of Yesu Mwana Grandiga. And if you dance that little jig, you became a part of this elite, see? Well, that doctrine came into the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Uganda. And I was forced to meet it. And I could not take a wheelbarrow load of Ellen White books around to read to these people. They didn't have the spirit of prophecy. All they had was the Bible. And I had to use the Bible only to help to bring that church together and get them straightened out on this. This was evangelicalism coming into the Adventist church. And I had to meet it head on, using the Bible only. And that forced me to study. And I came to the conclusion of the nature of Christ. I discovered agape. I didn't discover it in the seminary. I found it there in Uganda and what it means to believe in Jesus. And I began to preach the concepts of the 1888 message to those people. So then I came back to, to America on furlough, and the great uh, burden of my heart was to go to the seminary. I remember once in 1946 or so, we were having a division council in Bulawayo which was then Rhodesia. And um, they took some of us uh, in motor cars out to Cecil Rhodes' grave. And on the way, I was sitting in the back seat with Elder W.E. Reed, one of the three authors of Questions and Doctrine later. Great scholar, wonderful man, Englishman. And I was privileged to sit side by side with him. I said, Elder Reed, I'm worried about one thing, coming out here to be a missionary to East Africa, that I'll dry up and blow away intellectually. Can you suggest some books that I can read that may help me keep my brain alive? And he gave me a list of books, and when I later, I ordered them from Edinburgh, secondhand books. And I kept dreaming, oh, it's gonna be wonderful. And, and one of the, one of the books that, I, that just, uh, I loved, Skip, was Reinhold Niebuhr's. Reinhold Niebuhr was, was a great theologian, really. And I would take his books along with C.S. Lewis and Ellen White's books on safari. And I'd be gone for a week or 10 days out in the bush. And I would have a little light hooked up to my battery in the car. And we couldn't have night meetings, you know, so I had the whole evening free. And I would study, study. And these books just stretched my mind and I kept dreaming, oh, I'll be so glad when I can go to the Adventist seminary. Then I can meet people I can talk with who are on the level of Reinhold Niebuhr and C.S. Lewis and these other uh, deep thinkers. So I came back to go to the seminary. I don't know if I should tell you this, but this is the beginning of the 1888 Master Study Committee, actually. Shall I tell you? Yes, please. Yes. 
Well, the first class I went to was taught by George Vanderman on Righteous by Faith. And at first I was absolutely overwhelmed. I thought this young man is the Lord's anointed who's going to lead us into the promised land. I was just overjoyed to hear him in class. And on one occasion he told us you must read the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, which I'd never heard of. And I highballed it down to the library to read it. Those were the 24 sermons by A.T. Jones. Beautiful. The book is here. I tell you, it just, it was like reading the glad tidings. It was, uh, the same thing, but in different words, you know, just ravished my heart. I loved it. But after about 10 days, I got worried. Because the teacher was telling us things that uh, were like what I had met back there in Uganda. And they were perplexing. And actually what it was, it was the Buckmanite revival, vegetarian version, adapted for Adventism. And Vanderman's view at that time, now later he may have changed, I'm not criticizing the dear man, but at that time his view was that the evangelical churches understand righteousness by faith. And the 1888 message was only a revival of the teaching of Luther, Calvin, Wesley, and the Sunday keeping evangelicals. And that bothered me. Bothered me bad. Yeah. I was worried. For example, one of his illustrations, a lady went to the World's Fair in Chicago in 1939 and she put her quarter in the slot at the gate and nothing happened. She just stood there. Nothing happened. And finally somebody yelled at her, Lady, push! And she pushed and she walked in. And the point of the illustration was, we Seventh-day Adventists are perfectly willing to pay the price. We're not pushing hard enough. And I thought to myself, that is exactly backwards from the truth. There in Uganda, I was trying to help our church to get clear of this evangelicalism that was sweeping into the church. I discovered the cross. The cross is the heart of the Adventist message. Now we're coming to the history of the 1888 Message Study Committee, which I think you people ought to understand something about. Dear Brother Vanderman, in 1950, in the seminary, was teaching from E. Stanley Jones. He openly admitted it. He drew his illustrations from Jones. This one of the lady putting her quarter in the slot at the World's Fair, 1939, came straight from E. Stanley Jones. E. Stanley Jones, you remember, was the great Methodist missionary to India. Remember that? Wonderful man. Wrote a whole bunch of books. He wrote a book entitled The Way to Power and Poise that became a bestseller in 1951, a devotional book for every day in the year. And I sensed that these illustrations were evangelicalism, were not the 1888 concepts. So I went to the dear brother and we had a visit in his office. And I told him about my concern. And he said, well, Brother Wheeland, I agree with you. But I said, he said, I learned long ago not to express my convictions until I'm in a position to express them with authority. And he was in the general conference. 
And I thought, well, surely you have authority. But uh, we frankly disagreed. That was all. Well, E. Stanley Jones, bless him. Has anybody read his writings? He wrote a whole bunch of books, but the one I'm referring to was called The Way to Power and Poise. And Vanderman told us that every Adventist minister should read that book. E. Stanley Jones can help us preach righteousness by faith. We can learn from him how to present it. We can't go along with him on the ecumenical issues, but we can certainly go along with him on righteousness by faith. So I bought the book, began to study it, and I found, uh, you see, he would ha this was a, d a daily devotional, and he would have his little thoughts there, and then at the bottom he had a prayer, see? And one day he prayed, Oh God, I shall love myself in thee this day, for love of self is love of God. Uh -oh. You like that? No. 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 no Would that bother you at all, Joe? Yes. Uh -huh. A little bit later in the book, he's talking to his dead grandmother at her grave, communicating with her at her grave. So those things bothered me. So I protested. And I went to um, Brother George wouldn't listen to me, really. He had total disagreement with me. He said, I believe E. Stanley Jones is doing the, the right work. I believe he correctly understands righteous by faith. And I sincerely believe E. Stanley Jones was merely preaching evangelicalism that is a part of Babylon which is fallen and that we had no business going to E. Stanley Jones to learn how to preach the gospel of righteous by faith. And I thought, here are all these young ministers here in this seminary being taught this. And I felt, I have a concern. You may say, well, poor Brother Whelan, you certainly are a fanatic. You should have just kept still and done nothing. But I, the more I prayed about it and thought about it, the more I thought, hey, I've come from Uganda, I've joined the seminary, and what I'm hearing is virtually the same doctrine I met back there in Uganda that was a curse to the church in Uganda. And I was forced to meet the problem there, and here it's being taught right here in the seminary. And so I went to the president of the seminary. Now, I want to make that very clear to you people. I did not go to my fellow students. I did not talk to any other student. I went, first of all, straight to George Vandeman, but I got nowhere with him. I went straight to the president of the seminary. <coughs> right or wrong? If you have a problem, don't talk gossip. Go straight to the pastor or the conference president, I would say. Amen. Be loyal to organization of this church. I was loyal because I went to the proper authority. And I told the president of the seminary my concern. And I said, I have not talked to any of the students. I have only come to you. And he said, Brother Whelan, we don't think you belong here in the seminary. You should be spending your time gathering sh uh, seashells at the ocean. You should spend your furlough, not in study. That's the wrong thing for you to do. And I'm going to expel you today from the seminary. Ooh, that's nice. And he did. In fact, right there, he said, come with me in my car. We'll go to your apartment, and I'll count all the dishes and all the forks and knives and spoons and everything, and clear you out of your apartment today. Just like that. I said, uh, dear elder, what was his name? can't think of his name at the moment. I said, I am not in opposition to the seminary in any way at all. I just brought my concern to you that what we're hearing as righteous by faith is not what the Lord sent to us in 1888. 
no, Brother Whelan, we, we just can't have you here. So he counted all my forks and spoons and dishes and everything, and I got my suitcase and got out. Well, my wife was in Tennessee. She had malaria. She couldn't be with me. I'd spent the whole night in prayer, in weeping and in prayer. And I packed up the car to start the drive down to Tennessee. And I thought, well, before I get out of town, let me go by the General Conference and go down to the White Estate. And I'd like to know what Ellen White actually had to say about 1888, because I hear it taught in the seminary that our brethren accepted the message in 1888, that we've had it ever since as our firm possession. But I wonder what Ellen White actually had to say in her unpublished writings. So I parked my car with all my luggage inside, and I went in to the White Estate, and Elder Arthur White was away in South America. Elder Robinson was there, D.E. Robinson. He said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I, I'm a student at the seminary, and I've come. I'd like to see what Ellen White had to say about 1888. He said, well, that's a very sensitive subject. We don't usually let people in to read about that. Some people can misunderstand. And instead of me turning around and leaving, I just stood there. And it was a bit embarrassing. And he said, well, why do you want to know? And I said, well, I've, I've been in the seminary. And I've heard conflicting things in the seminary about 1888. I'd like to know what Ellen White said. He said, well, who are you? I said, well, I gave him my name. I said, I'm the president of the Uganda Mission, which is now a Uganda Union. And I know your son Virgil. We're members together of the East African Union Committee. Oh, oh, well, all right, come in. And he brought me a file, which contained Ellen White's diary and letters that she had written to various ones of the Brethren about 1888. I hadn't read very much, but what I realized, what I was hearing was directly opposite what I was hearing in the seminary. A thought came to me, I wish I could copy this. And I asked him, could I copy? He said, yes, if you don't publish. Well, I had no thought of publishing. So I brought my portable typewriter in from my car, and I typed like mad. I typed fast. And I typed a number of those pages on my typewriter. Five o'clock came, time to close. I had already decided I'll go to a, a motel for the night. And I said, may I take this file home overnight and I'll bring it back in the morning. No, it must go back in the vault, but you can finish tomorrow morning. So I left my typewriter there and I went to a motel. Came back eight o'clock in the morning. He said, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I gave you the wrong file yesterday. But if you want to type some more, here's another file about 1888. And that file proved to be the typescript of the book, Testimonies to Ministers. Now, I'm pretty dumb, but it dawned on me, why should I spend my time typing what I have in the book? So I thanked him and gave him back the file. He did not ask for my notes, for which I'm very thankful because those notes are in this book here. Amen. Yeah. In, in uh, February 1950, uh, dear Brother Vanderman wrote a book review of E. Stanley Jones's latest book, urging Adventist ministers all over the world, you must get this book by E. Stanley Jones. It will help you to understand and preach righteousness by faith. So, I was worried. I wrote him, of course, and he wrote me back and said, please don't write me any more 
I am firmly convinced that E. Stanley Jones understands the truth of righteous by faith. Then I thought, well, here this is going out to all Adventist ministers all over the world. It's confusion, confounded. What's my duty? So then I wrote to Roy Allen Anderson of the Ministerial Association and told him what I'd discovered, my concern. He wrote me back a little short letter, Dear Brother Whelan, we had become friends in Africa. He had come out for the camp meeting circuit and we had traveled all around Lake Victoria together, Roy Allen Anderson and I, and we became fast friends, you know. And he said, Dear Brother Whelan, I know you are a genuine Christian. I know George is a genuine Christian. God bless you both. Sincerely yours, Roy Allen Anderson. <laughs> And I thought, well, hmm, what shall I do? So um, I wrote to the General Conference President, Elder J. L. McElhaney. I had met him when I was a student in college because I used to wash and simonize his car for five dollars. <laughs> Dear man, and I wrote him my concern. And he wrote me back a beautiful letter, thanked me, said, oh, Brother Whelan, we must be careful to preserve the purity of the message. Thank you for your concern. He was courteous. He didn't try to shoot me down. But about that time, here comes the Adventist Review, then called the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. And here was a little article by W.A. Spicer, who was the granddaddy of all Adventist ministers, a wonderful man. He was the man who first detected the pantheism in Dr. Kellogg's writing. Keen mind, because he was a missionary in India for some years. And the article was uh, uh, an article about the danger of Easter, Eastern mysticism infiltrating our Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. And one of the key words of this dangerous Easter, Eastern mysticism is the word poise, poise. And that was the title of uh, E. Stanley Jones's new book, you know, The Way to Power and Poise. And through my head came the idea. Could it be that Elder Spicer is referring to this book review in the ministry magazine for February, which was a few weeks earlier? So I wrote Elder Spicer a letter, and told him about my concern. And he wrote me back a handwritten letter. Dear Brother Wieland, thank God, I, I've got the words memorized. Thank God you saw the evil in that book. I thought St Jones would try to cover it up. I regard E. Stanley Jones as doing the worst work of any modern religious agent. If others would protest as you have done, it might do some good. Sincerely yours, W. A. Spicer. I spent a whole night in prayer and weeping. When I realized that my deepest heart convictions were contrary to the brethren. And I prayed, O oh Lord, I must be honest and tell what I can see is truth. If I'm wrong and you have to send me to hell, I will go. But I ask for one thing. Give me a special niche down there in hell because I believe in what happened on the cross of Calvary. Amen. The tears were flowing. I think I must have wept like Mary Magdalene wept. Uh -huh. One reason why I love this story, because I just couldn't stop crying. I was only 33 years old. 32, I guess I was. But I got peace. And I, Skip, I lost my fear of the brethren. Amen. I lost my fear of you guys, too. <laughs> and when, he, when 
W.A. Spicer, the granddaddy of all that, former, former General Conference president, highly respected man, took his stand right by my side. Amen. I think that encouraged me. So we got to the General Conference session. Brother Short was a delegate too. He and I were not particular friends at all. What session was that? 1950. We were both at College Dale for a while, and Donald Short was Superman in my eyes. Beautifully organized, precise, successful young man. But it so happens he had spent eight or nine years in East Africa and was going home on furlough the same time we went home after only three years. And we traveled on the ships together through the Red Sea and the Suez and the Mediterranean around to England and had to wait there for a month to get a boat to cross the Atlantic and so on. This was in 1949. So we got to be friends. And we were members together of the Union Committee because he was the manager of our press in East Africa. And we got there to the general conference session in San Francisco. The Sabbath before this session was a ministerial association meeting, which we always have before the session. And on that Sabbath, L.K. Dixon, who was General Conference Vice President, got up and he said, we must take a right turn next week at our session where we took a wrong turn in 1888. And I said, amen. Of course, nobody heard me, but among those 20,000 people. But I was happy to hear him say that. And then another general conference man got up and said, we want everybody who's here to be open and tell us what you believe, what your concern is. Pray with us for the Lord to bless at this session. And open up your hearts to us. Well, what they did was, they put up a microphone and everybody who wanted to give a testimony was to come down and give a testimony, you see? And the proper thing to do, because you had only five or 10 seconds at most to do it, you see? And you get up and say, I'm so thankful I'm at this general conference session, and so I may the Lord bless, amen. And you walked on. That's all you could say, see? And I thought, how could I possibly go down to that microphone there and keep those people for at least an hour while I explain to them my own heart concern? <laughs> And I, I, I knew I couldn't do that. There's no point in going down and saying, oh, brethren, pray for me, I'm glad to be here. No, I, that would be empty, see? And so the more I prayed about it, the more I thought. And we went to, we went to every meeting of the pre-session, which was entitled Christ-Centered Preaching. And as we listened carefully, as I listened carefully, it came to me that what was being preached was evangelicalism. Not the Christ of the 1888 message, but the Christ of the popular churches, the Christ of Billy Graham. That's what was being preached. I thought, this is not going to finish God's work. We've got to find the true Christ and present the message that God gave to us. So, I write a letter to the General Conference Committee. And I poured out my heart in that letter to the brethren. When I got done, I felt like I did this morning. <laughs> did I do wrong? Am I a fanatic? Am I a fool? And I thought, I dare not send this letter till I get some counsel from somebody and I thought, who can I take it to? And I thought about maybe my division president. But I thought, no, he won't even read the letter. He'll just tell me, shut up, boy. That's the way he talked. He was a personal friend, a wonderful man. He's the one who put me in as president of the Uganda mission. Then I thought, well, maybe I can take it to Roy Allen Anderson. Maybe, maybe he can give me some counsel about this letter. I thought, he won't have time to talk to me. He'll just say, well, Brother Wheeler, I know you're a true Christian, and uh, everybody's all right, so Lord bless you. 
But then I thought of one person who might take the time to read it. Somebody I could trust who's honest. I said, Donald, read this letter. And tell me straight out to my face if I am a fool. Well, Donald Short read the letter, never said a word that he got through. He said, Bob, I'll sign that too. That meant I had all the hard work of retyping this four-page letter, this time in the first person, plural. And we both signed it. That led to this. The brethren were very unhappy when they got the letter. There came a notice on the, where the electronic sign was, you know, R.J. Whelan, D.K. Short, please come to room so-and-so. And we came and they gave us a letter. They said, we have received your letter. We don't understand what you're saying. There's one thing we're sure and certain. You are on the path that Satan trod. And we are canceling your return bookings to Africa until such a time as we can have a visit with you. And the camp meeting season is on and we will not have, a, have time <clears throat> to meet with you until September 16. And we will see you in the General Conference office on September 16. Now this was now early June. Driving home to Florida from San Francisco, we both realized, we were driving separately of course, that we're gonna to have to say something. Our lives are at stake. And so to defend our very lives as Adventist ministers, we knew the idea was we would be put out of the ministry unless we made something clear here. And so when we got back home, I went to Florida and Donald Short went to Tacoma Park because he was still in the seminary, see? They didn't throw him out. And together we wrote a manuscript entitled 1888 Re-Examined. It grew to 202 full scrap pages with over 500 Ellen White exhibits. And we came to the meeting September 16 with that manuscript. Donald in Toma Park had arranged to have it what we call cyclostyled or mimeographed, you know, and he made 50 copies. And we gave 16 copies to the General Conference Brethren. If you had visited the GC offices during the next week, you would have seen Brethren all over the building reading that manuscript. When they read it, they said, we know you are loyal Seventh-day Adventists. And we have approved of your return to Africa as missionaries. We beg you, preach righteous by faith with all the power you have. God bless your work. But don't tell the 1888 message to the Africans. They can't understand it. But we are not as yet responding to your manuscript, we will place your manuscript in the hands of a special committee known as the Defense Literature Committee. That's the committee that replies to people like uh, Ken Wright and Dale Ratzliff and so on, you see. And they will, in time, send their report to you. So back to Africa we went, and finally a year or so later, we got their report. And then we wrote a response to that, and the letters went back and forth for years. And Brother Short and I realized
that we are very, very mortal. Elder Sort is very ill at the present time. I'm not ill, thank the Lord. Hope I'm not. Don't think I am. Could be, but I don't know. I think I'm all right. And we thought maybe someday after we die, if die we must, and I, I'm not talking about dying because I still cherish the blessed hope of seeing Jesus come in the clouds of heaven. But if we have to die, then we think we ought to release all of our correspondence with the General Conference. And so we photocopied all of our letters from the time we wrote that original uh, appeal to the General Conference Committee at the, at the session. We photographed their response to that. We photocopied all of our correspondence unedited totally, exactly like it was. And we published it in a big book entitled Faith on Trial. Now this is not the book. Fact is, we have sold out the edition that we printed. But we thought it would be a good idea if all of our correspondence were on file so people could see for themselves exactly what we said. And I included in the collection, my correspondence with Elder Froome, which was some years later. The 1888 Message Study Committee started in this way. In 1950, when we wrote this original manuscript here that we gave to the brethren, one of the copies in the General Conference building fell into the hands of a young lady who was one of the secretaries there. She'd been having a very severe problem, spiritually, with the brethren, because she saw things that didn't add up. And she tells how when she'd be walking down the sidewalk in Tacoma Park, and here comes a general conference man in the opposite direction, she would cross the street to avoid having to meet him. That was how difficult her problem had become. She was discouraged. Spiritual. Her name was Helen Smith. The time finally came that she retired, but she got this manuscript, yes, and she read it, and it brought her to her knees, it brought tears to her eyes. She was converted. She loved it. She loved the 1888 message. She studied it. And then when we finally came back from Africa to retire in 1984 because of my brother's accident, she had retired. And in 1985, the early part of the year, she wrote me a letter, said, Dear Bob, must we wait for the general conference? Can't we do something? Can't we try to give the message to the people? If I get some people together, would you come and tell us what the message is? Could I say no to that? I had been ordained, solemnly ordained, by L.C. Evans, for whom this building is named. He is a man who laid his hands on my head to ordain me Amen. to the ministry. And how could I say no to a request to come and tell somebody the good news of the 1888 message? I said, Helen, I'll be glad to come and do what I can. And so she wrote letters, made a few phone calls, got 120 people together at Camp Mohaven in the Ohio Conference. By that time, of course, Donald Short was in the States. There was Helen Cates, she loved the message, and her husband. And there was an ordained pastor from Kansas, Missouri, who had wandered into an ABC and picked up a copy 
of my book, An Introduction to the 1888 Message, the Southern Public published. And he accepted the message, he loves it. So the five of us constituted the beginning of the 1888 Message Study Committee. And so we all met there at Camp Mohaven. And R.J. Gravel was one of those who came up from Florida, was present at that meeting. And the people there said, we want to have a newsletter to keep in touch with each other. And so Helen's, she, she was now Helen Kate, she became the editor, the first editor of the 1888 Message Glad Tidings newsletter, which now Carol is editor of. And they said, we want to have another meeting. So Helen appealed to the Ohio Conference, could we have Mount Vernon Academy, Mount Vernon Church and Academy, for another meeting, because Camp Mohaven wouldn't be big enough for those who'd want to come. And the conference brethren said, oh, no, no, no. They were scared already. Anything with 1888 in it is suspicious. Helen Tate was a lady who believed in prayer. And she prayed and prayed earnestly, Lord, please open a door. And guess what happened? Andrews University opened their arms wide, said, you're welcome. Come. Amen. And in 1986, we had what we called a National 1888 Message Conference at Andrews. And they liked us, said, come back next year. We came back 1987. For several years, we came back. Then we thought we ought not to confine it to the Lake Union, let's try elsewhere. So we got invited to Southern College, and then to La Sierra, then to Union College, and then to Pacific Union College, and then we went to Atlantic Union College, then I think we had one up in Canada there. So we've had them all around, except Southwestern University. But we got in this time, and we're thankful that we're here. And this pretty well brings you up to date on the history of the 1888 message. A, a spiral bound book entitled, Carol? Yeah, what is the 1888 message? That's the response from the Primacy Committee. Well, that's our response to their response, actually, you see. But their response has been published. In fact, we have published it. And you can probably get it on the internet from the General Conference. But they did write to quite an extensive response on the actual committee. There's a lady there. Now, I'm free to tell anything that happened on that committee. The brethren said, you are welcome to tell the world what happened on this committee. Dr. V. Meister, the only lady on the committee, at the very beginning, she said, I hate that word 1888. I hope I never hear it again. That was her attitude. But by the time we were near the end of the committee, she had changed her mind. And she gave us a statement, a printed statement, I think it's 12 or 13 things that she likes about what we're saying on the 1880 Study Committee. She became our friend, really. The report would have been favorable if two things had not happened. Well, three things. Number one, the General Conference President, Elder Falkenberg, was forced to resign. And he's the one who started the committee. He's the one who said to me, I want you to know, and these are his exact words, I want you to know, I believe this 1888 message with all my heart, and I want the General Conference to proclaim it and put you out of business, he said to me. Yes. To which I said, Amen, brother. If the General Conference will proclaim this message, we will be glad to disappear. In fact, in our Constitution, the words are there. 
if the general conference proves that we're wrong, or if they take over the message, we will turn over our assets to the general conference. Is that right, Carol? That's in our Constitution, thing. Amen. We want the general conference to proclaim the message. Number two, the chairman, Calvin Rock, abandoned us at the very end. Maybe he got tied up with other things, I don't know, but he didn't show up for the last two meetings. And the co-chairman had to take over, Elder Robert Klusterheis. And he is the division president in Africa who fired me <laughs> for no reason whatsoever. In fact, the publishing director of the division in Africa with whom I worked out there, I was, my job was writing books for the African comporters, said to me, this is the work of the devil, he said. And I said to the brethren, I'll, I am busy doing work. See, I was, I was um, condensing the five conflict of the ages books for the Africans. to get them down to about half their original length to make it easier for Africans to read them, you see. Not changing a word of Ellen White, just condensing like the Reader's Digest condenses a book, you see. I was busy and I wasn't finished yet. And so I, I wrote to Elder Klusterheis and the other division presidents there, and I said, well, I'll be very happy to work for nothing. You can stop paying me a salary, that's just fine. But I'm going to stay here until my work is finished. And I told the, uh, the treasurer there, who was in Nairobi, I said, if you want to send the police and cart me off to the air airport, that's up to you. I'm staying here until I finish the work God gave me to do. Amen. And I stayed there. And they never stopped my salary. Hmm. Anyway, that was number two. And number three, the General Conference had put onto that committee several prominent individuals who had already condemned us in public in print. Mm. Now, will any judge allow a jury to sit who has already condemned the accused? That's contrary to, to common law. You're a lawyer. But both of, the, of these individuals had condemned us in print. And when Calvin Rock was absent, and after Falkenberg had to resign, these individuals took over the primacy of the gospel <coughs> committee. That's where we were. But let's don't get discouraged. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And I have this firm conviction, if only by the grace of God, we can learn to preach the gospel truthfully, there will be results. The power is there. <clears throat> May we kneel for a closing prayer, please? Loving Father, thank you that we could have this little meeting together. And our hearts are beating in unison. We long for the time when you will take the reins in your own hands, Father, and direct the finishing of your work in the church and in all the world. I pray, Father, that each one who's here may sense a motivation from your Holy Spirit to study for himself or herself. Thank you for every blessing you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.